Chapter 13. In some ways, the rest of that week was wonderful. Hannah, Bess, and Sadie were the only students at school. Miss Walters tailored the lessons to their needs. She had both of the older girls spend more time on arithmetic, and Hannah paid extra attention to history. Besides the enjoyment of school, her work at home held a little extra interest when, on Tuesday evening, she cooked the prairie turnips. Softened after their three-day soak, they boiled up nicely. Hannah was so eager for a taste that she burned the roof of her mouth. Papa had said that they tasted of half potato, half turnip, and she agreed. More substantial than a turnip, not as starchy as a potato. She was charmed by the addition of a new flavor to what often seemed like a never-ending, never-changing menu of cornmeal and beans. That week, Miss Walters always found time during the school day for a reading session, which all of them enjoyed. On Wednesday, they spent an entire hour reading aloud to one another, with Bess and Hannah taking it in turns to choose pieces from the sixth reader, not the fifth. Hannah wondered why Miss Walters had made the switch. Near dismissal on Friday, the teacher finally spoke about it. Bess and Hannah, I have an idea that I'd like to put to you. Hannah, your father told me that you would need one or two more terms of school before you could graduate. In assessing your studies, I find that I disagree. I think you're very nearly ready now, she smiled. Hannah shifted a little in her seat, unaccustomed to praise. I, um, thank you, miss. Bess, in my opinion, you are, are, you are in a similar position, and I know that you are hoping to become a school teacher yourself. Yes, miss, Bess replied. Hannah was surprised. Of the oldest girls, Edith seemed to Hannah the most likely to become a teacher. Edith was friendly and vivacious and never seemed nervous when singled out to respond, while Bess often looked like Hannah felt, as if she were forcing herself to speak. Yet, although Bess's voice was quiet, she always spoke clearly. We have an unusual opportunity here, Miss Walters said. Mr. Harris has written to Washington to inquire about, about certain laws governing school enrollment and attendance. The families of the other students are planning to wait until he receives a response. There are only two more weeks of the term, and I doubt very much that he will hear anything before school is finished. She folded her hands together and leaned forward to look at the girls earnestly. With so few students, I have decided not to hold an exhibition. I've been thinking that we can end this term another way. I believe that if the two of you work hard on the lessons I set for you, you can be prepared to take the graduation examinations on the last day. Your scores will likely not be as high as they might be if you had more time. But if you perform as I expect you to, you will complete your studies and the school board will be able to grant you diplomas. Hannah realized at once what Miss Walters was not saying. If she graduated, the townspeople would send their children to school again next term because she would no longer be there. It was a compromise, an unsatisfying one. Oh, rotten eggs, that's solving the problem by going around it, not by facing it. Bess answered first. I'll speak to my parents, miss. For myself, I would be glad to graduate this term. If I can get a teaching certificate and teach next term, it would be a great help to my family. I think my parents will see it that way. Very good, Bess, Miss Walters said. She turned to Hannah. Hannah waited a few moments and took a long breath before she felt able to speak. I want to sew, she said. She looked up at Miss Walters. I don't need a teaching certificate for that. I don't even need to graduate. I want to make dresses in my father's shop. She was astonished to find herself telling Miss Walters what essentially was private business, but now that she'd gotten started, she couldn't stop. He doesn't think I can do it, but I know I can. If I could graduate, maybe it will, I don't know, prove to him that, that I can do what I set out for. Miss Walters nodded thoughtfully. Talk to your father about it, she said. I'm sure he'll understand. I will, miss. Hannah wasn't as sure as Miss Walters seemed to be. I'll have his answer, my answer, on Monday. When Hannah arrived home that day, she found a note from Papa asking her to come straight to the shop. The building was now fully framed and sighted, and work was beginning on the interior. While Papa and Charlie Hart did the heavy carpentry work, Hannah had been following behind them, scraping and sanding. The first floor would be divided into three spaces. The front half of the building was the shop. The back half was to be partitioned to form a sizable storeroom and their kitchen parlor, with a lean-to outside the back door. 
The upstairs would be two bedrooms and a small sitting area. Papa was about to leave to meet the afternoon freight train. He was expecting a load of furniture and fit for, uh, fitments from Chicago. The goods he ordered were shipped first to Tracy in Minnesota, then came to LaForge on the railroad line between Tracy and Pierre. Papa sent in the orders by mail, and it usually took around three weeks for the goods to arrive. Hannah stopped him and pulled a folded piece of paper from her pocket. What's this? he asked. The storeroom, she said. I was thinking, you're going to be in the shop most of the time, and I'm the one who'll be in and out of the storeroom. I have a few ideas to make things more sensible for me to work there. She'd done a rough sketch of the place and written a list as well. It was a real room, much more than a closet. There was a countertop along two walls with drawers, cupboards, and shelves below and above. The list contained several items, like wall hooks and baskets and pasteboard boxes for more storage. Her sketch showed a nicely organized storeroom, but in Hannah's mind, it would eventually become something more, a workroom where she could sew dresses. Papa tapped on the sketch. Cook stove here? Yes. She'd drawn the cook stove in the center of the partition wall. The front of the stove with two burners in the oven would be in the kitchen, while the rear with its warming shelf was in the workroom. It'll warm both spaces in the winter, so there won't be any need for a heater in the storeroom. That'll save on coal. Good, he said. Show this to Charlie. He handed the paper back to her and left for the depot. Hannah wanted to do a little hop skip of satisfaction. Cheer enough, the back of the book cook stove would heat the storeroom. What she hadn't mentioned was that it could also be used to heat a flat iron, necessary for dressmaking. She talked to Mr. Hart about a few more details. Could the cupboards go all the way to the ceiling? Dusting the tops of cupboards was such a bother. And could he put a fold-out ironing board into the wall? And no cupboards or shelves under the countertop where it passed beneath the window? That would be like a little desk. She'd have a chair there for sitting and sewing where the light's best. It wasn't until Sunday night that the subject of school arose and Papa was the one who brought it up. They were sitting in the kitchen after supper. There was no place to sit in the parlor anymore. It was too full of store goods. Papa was reading the newspaper while Hannah bent over her arithmetic book. Heard you and the Harris girls are the only ones in school now, he said. She looked up in surprise. She'd not talked to him about Miss Walter's proposal. As long as I'm attending school, it's all the same to him. I don't want to give him a chance to say I should stop going. Yes, Papa, she replied carefully. Miss Walters is preparing Bess and me for diploma examinations at the end of next week. So if you pass, you'll be finished? Yes. Silence. She was about to return to her studies when he spoke again. A few people have been saying I should take you out of school, he said. They say it's not fair that you're keeping all the rest from attending. She wanted to protest that it was their choice not to send their children to school, but Papa was still talking. The way I see it, you're not stopping anyone, he said. Only the government or the school board can do that. Hannah sat up a little straighter, heartened by his words. Has the school board said anything to you? He shook his head. Still, seems like Miss Walters has found a solution. You graduate, that's what you want and then you're out of school. That's what those other folks want. Everybody gets what they want. She hesitated trying to decide what to say. No, Papa, I do want to graduate, but I also want to be able to attend school like the other students. And I want everyone else to see that it's only fair. Miss Walter's solution doesn't achieve any of that. Besides, why should people get what they want when what they want is just plain wrong? She could have spoken those thoughts out loud, but she would have felt as if she were fighting battles everywhere, in town, in school, at home. She needed at least a little rest from the fighting. I'll do my best to pass, Papa, she said instead. And after that, she would help Papa in the shop just as Mama had done. Papa had intended for Hannah to work in the storeroom, keeping track of orders, making lists of supplies that ran short. Hannah had other plans. Mama had been Papa's seamstress, first as his employee and then, after they married, as his partner. Their men's tailor shop had been patronized by all kinds of people, including both Chinese and white customers. The shop had earned an excellent reputation based on two things, Papa's service and Mama's sewing. Mama had taught Hannah to sew when she was barely more than a toddler. 
first with a big blunt tapestry needle that she pushed in and out of a piece of wire mesh, then a slimmer needle on burlap, which had a coarse weave that helped her keep her stitches in a straight line, and finally on linen. Over the years, Hannah had learned far more than the mechanics of stitching fabric choice, color, design, and especially how to suit the garment to the customer. Spending nearly every waking moment in the shop, she had absorbed all those lessons. She aimed to honor Mama's legacy by becoming the Edmonds dress goods designer and seamstress, whose garments were so fine and well-made that every woman in town would want one. She would sew her way into the hearts of the women of La Forge. Hannah spent the next two weeks alternating between studying feverishly and ordering dress goods for the shop. Papa brought her several wholesale catalogs for fabric. She paged through them much more eagerly than she did her history book. She discussed her choices with Papa. Several types of muslin for bed sheets, undergarments, nightclothes, a wide selection of calicos for every day, poplins, chalices, and printed lawns for summertime visiting and church dresses. Only a handful of woolens. They would order more of those toward the end of the summer. A wine-colored watered silk, a black cashmere, a midnight blue velvet. Papa ejected to the last three. Never sell them out here, he said. Those are for city folks. You might be right, Papa, she said. But remember in Los Angeles, how Mama always had a bolt or two of silk on hand in case a gentleman wanted a silk shirt? She once told me that it was important to have nice things in a shop, even if they're not going to sell, because they bring in customers just to look, and then you can end up making a sale. What Mama actually said was, sometimes beautiful things aren't for buying, they're for dreaming. Hannah did not repeat that to Papa. He would have dismissed it as cod swallop. Pick two then, he said. I'm not buying three whole bolts that might not sell. She chose the silk and the cashmere feeling victorious, but he would not yield an inch on the question of the mirror. The shop in Los Angeles had been fitted with a huge wall mirror, three feet wide and six feet tall. No other shop in Chinatown had such magnificent mirror. It might well have been one of the biggest in the city. The mirror was family legend. Hannah had heard the story many times. Mama had insisted on the mirror and she'd had to fight Papa to get it. For one thing, it had been almost unthinkably expensive. For another, Papa was convinced that it would never arrive intact, that it was sure to break during the cross-country journey from back east. Against his expectations, the mirror arrived in one piece. As soon as it was installed, the shop seemed grander, airier, more spacious. The mirror reflected daylight from the windows and lamplight in the evenings. It immediately became the shop's centerpiece. Accustomed to peering at themselves in small, handheld looking glasses or cheap, uneven, saucer-sized mirrors, folks came to the shop just to see the big mirror and their own reflections, full length and in perfect clarity. Hannah had lived her whole childhood with that beautiful mirror. Now she knew that she'd taken it for granted. As a young girl, she'd loved blowing a puff of breath at the glass. The condensation obscured her reflection. Then she would watch as the moisture dried and giggle to see her face revealed little by little. She wanted the same kind of mirror for the new shop, but Papa barely let her finish the question. No, he said with a glare. We don't need any kind of mirror, let alone one like that. We're selling dress goods, not clothes. She knew from his tone of voice that it was no use arguing with him. How had Mama convinced him? Hannah would have to figure that out somehow because she could not possibly become a dressmaker in a shop without a mirror. On the last day of the term, she and Bess took their examinations in grammar, arithmetic, history, geography, and orthography. Miss Walters allowed them to choose the order of the tests. Hannah began with arithmetic, her least favorite, to get it out of the way. Bess did the same. They were given an hour to write down their answers for each test except arithmetic. An hour and a quarter. In history, 45 minutes. The questions were difficult and seemed to get harder as the day went on. Hours later, Hannah answered the final question, which required her to diagram a complex compound sentence. She was so tired that her pen wobbled as she circled the words and drew the lines. You may wait if you wish, girls, Miss Walters said. I won't be long. Miss Walters had been grading each, each exam as the girls took the next one. At first, Hannah had found it distracting, 
wondering what mistakes she'd made and how Miss Walters was marking them. But the challenges of the test had forced her to concentrate, and she'd spent most of the time alone in her head. Now she stood and walked to the door. She badly needed to stretch her legs. She stepped out into the yard. It was very warm, the sun heating the air without a breeze to freshen it, as if pressing hard towards summer. She walked toward the corner of the schoolhouse to stand in the shadow cast by the wall. Was it harder than you thought it would be? Hannah turned in surprise. Bess was in the doorway. She came outside and joined Hannah in the shade. Well, I knew the arithmetic would be hard, Hannah said. It always is for me. As for the rest, she looked at Bess and shrugged. I'll start over. All of it was hard. I thought so too. Those history questions? I didn't have enough time. I know. I could only write down one or two points when there was so much more I thought I should include. What about geography? What did you write for the principal rivers of Europe? The girls chatted for a few minutes more. Then Miss Walters came to the door and called them in. Bess smiled. Good luck to both of us, she said. Hannah smiled back. For a moment, it didn't seem to matter what she had scored on the tests because maybe she had made a friend. That's the end of the chapter.